back here on a pond photo review 503 and now joining me on the phone we have inside the star.com staff writer walter eats coming on to preview cowboys and eagles in the nfc east walter welcome to a pond photo review oh thank you for having me sean it's uh, definitely great to be here anytime anytime so here in studio with john goetley and joey valdez still so let's jump ahead to the matchup that a lot of people are going to be talking about and that's Cowboys at Eagles, of course, everybody buzzing about what Tony Romo was able to do against the Giants in week one, snatching a victory from the hands of defeat. They were beat up the whole game. You lose Des Bryant, really just a bizarre game on both sides. But in the end, all that mattered was the Cowboys get to 1-0 and immediately have to regroup and go on the road to face a tough Philly team. Uh, that's uh, the, yeah, the, the game against the Giants was definitely not how you would anticipate a win. I believe the stat was that was the first time they've uh, the Cowboys themselves have won a game um, being negative three in a turnover ratio since I believe 2006. It's not typically something you see, in the, especially in the NFL. You don't give that many turnovers and particularly win. Unfortunately for the Giants, they are on paper, they were definitely undermanned um, talent-wise. So I think I honestly do believe that's what the win can be contributed to. The Giants don't have enough firepower on offense without Cruz. Donnell, uh, their tight end, Larry Donnell, their tight end, still isn't showing up to be the productive player that he showed one of the three t- the three touchdown game he had last year. He's not consistent. Um, their defense, uh, their defense looked better for the turnovers, but they they there were some holes in their defense all game long. And uh, Tony Romo himself, give him some credit. You didn't see this from him a lot last year, but at the line of scrimmage, he was. He was basically writing a, a poem with what he was doing. It, it was perfect how he was getting them, getting the team in the play call that was perfect for the alignment the Giants were giving. They were basically playing two safeties, basically a new jury row, basically just out of the zip code in the entire game, and he picked them apart. Yeah, the Cowboys' offense, there was a lot of concern about what it was going to look like without DeMarco Murray, and the thing that we noticed that was different was just how much more complex it was in, in really you know a good way but leading itself to those mistakes that caused those Giants turnovers, like you mentioned, to keep them in the game. It, you know, With DeMarco Murray, it was so simple to run the football. You have Romo, turn around, hand it to him, be physical at the line of scrimmage, and he'll fall forward for five or six yards on average. Here it was Dunbar leading the way in the receiving game from the back position. Randall and McFadden looking pretty good as well. So you know, a lot to get in sync for this Cowboys offense in just a short time. We never really even saw what we saw from in the Giants game in the preseason. So they're still working on a lot of things, and they're going to have to be in tune here against the Eagles in Week 2. Uh, yes, the, the Eagles, uh, uh, specifically their defensive line, presents a lot more challenges than um, the Giants' defensive line uh, does. Uh, as, I, as a part of, I wrote my smooth view on inside the dot com that was went out earlier this morning, is you have like Fletcher Cox, Benny Logan, who likes to talk a lot, um, and Vinny Curry specifically that like to get pressure on the quarterback and Connor Barwin off um, the outside linebacker position, it, they did not get uh, basically no pressure at all against the Falcons. Uh, I believe uh, Matt Ryan was only hit twice, hurry three times, and with, they had one sack. It, they didn't get any pressure at all on a, a Falcons offensive line that's just not as – they're just plain and simple not as good as the Dallas Cowboys offensive line. But with that being said, last year the Cowboys, and especially in the first game, the Thanksgiving game, they, there was some issues with that uh, defensive line, especially um, Benny Logan being extremely disruptive. Um, so the, the, I wouldn't take what the Eagles really did for the entire game against the Falcons and expect that to be what we're going to see the entire game against the Cowboys because if they give Tony Romo that much time, we saw what happened against the Giants. He was only – Romo was only hit – well legally once he there was a late hit that wasn't called i believe on the final drive that he got hit right in the back um so if they give him if they're not able to get pressure it's going to be a very long day for the eagles defense yeah absolutely you know for the Cowboys side of it tony romo is going to need his time to throw and hopefully hit some plays downfield i think if this game turns into where both teams are picking up first down after first down in a shootout type game it's good to favor the Eagles to be able to snap off a big play at some point the cowboys are good enough to try to dominate this game by controlling the ball on offense but knowing when to hit a big play downfield and if Romo has time to throw he's gonna you know not have Des Bryant of course which is something we can talk about but he'll have Terrence Williams and Cole Beasley and Gavin Escobar and other guys that can make big plays. 
Oh, that's very true. But uh, I actually, if a game turns into an offensive shootout, I don't believe that actually might not favor. I don't believe that actually favors the Eagles, especially because um, if you just look at their numbers, look at the advanced statistics, I would take Tony Romo over Sam Bradford any day. Uh, Sam Bradford's not someone who ever is really going to push the ball down the field. He's not really going to get away from any pressure. And if you put pressure on him, his his pass efficiency goes six, goes extremely down. But if he if that's the thing, it's also going to be the same thing the Eagles are going to need to do. If they're going to have to put pressure on Sam Bradford without without pressure, I believe Sam Bradford is around a 71 percent uh, has a 71 percent pass completion rating. Um, and when pressure is on him, I believe that drops all the way like down into the the four, the forties or maybe even lower. Um, so he's if we get pressure, they the Cowboys get pressure on Sam Bradford. There's definitely he's going to have a very long day, but that's going to be a little difficult uh, now that Randy Gregory is not there. Um, as he was extremely disruptive against the Giants, he made Eric Flowers, which I did project because Eric Flowers has extremely slow feet and he was forced into being the Giants' left tackle. He's really a right tackle. He does not have the feet. And uh, Randy Gregory uh, dominated him when he was in the game him on, on his pass start. rushes. So uh, say that one more time? He caught him on a false start play as well, trying to get to the edge a little bit quicker to go block Gregory. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you know, you're right about the loss of Gregory as huge. But in a way, I, I also kind of look at the way the Cowboys will play defenses, at least for this week and fo- just focused on this week alone, I look at it as almost a positive thing that they're not going to have the full strength for guys to run out there. You know, how many times did we see in past years when they had all these different guys they tried to use with Rob Ryan or Marinelli that it would just look borderline embarrassing trying to run these guys on and off the field. There'd be miscommunication after miscommunication and teams would just burn the Cowboys downfield. And if there's any coach that can do that and can get the favorable matchups on the field using his tempo, it's Tip Kelly. So in a way, I think at least for this week, it's good to have a much simpler defense. You know, you're not going to be able to to organize yourself before every snap against this Eagles up tempo attack. Just dig your cleats into the into the ground. You got Tyrone Crawford in the middle of that defensive line, who hopefully can be disruptive. You have Sean Lee kind of being a force in the middle that can get guys lined up and hopefully make a play on the ball. You have a fast secondary that can hopefully fly around and make plays. For now, Marinelli, just trust your guys that you have out there and try to go make a play and not be worried about matching up for every situation and possibly getting burnt on a big play by a guy like Damage Bulls. You uh, specifically um, hit what the problem was with Rob Ryan's defense to a T. It's so complex. There's so many different packages that it creates scenarios where your defense can get out of position just by the package you're calling to get in there. And, and, and that, as we did see for previous years when Rob, uh, Rob Ryan was in Dallas, there was some problems with that. Uh, there's no way to get around that. Rob Marinelli has a lot. It's a lot more simpler scheme, but it, it stresses a lot different things than Rob Ryan's defense does. And I think when we're looking at this Eagles attack, you mentioned uh, Tyrone Crawford being extremely important. The Eagles, the guards are – they're not that great either. So Tyrone Crawford is going to have to earn his um, new contract, nine, uh, uh, five years, uh, $45 million contract. Uh, this is a, a, a game where he's going to be needed to get uh, pressure directly in the face of uh, Sam Bradford. Um, Nick Hayden, who's often maligned, which I, looking at film and looking at the run defense, I, I don't quite understand why Nick Hayden is maligned when he's in the game because his job is not to – get tackles his job is to eat a block so people like sean lee um anthony hitchens can run free and sean lee is a huge huge addition back to this defense he led the team in tackles last week he uh from penn state uh he's a such a great he has such a great feel for the game he has great instincts he he never great trait great technique he gets never gets himself out of position and always makes him sure that he's in the best uh, position to make a tackle. Um, it's great watching Sean Lee on film and, and uh, watching the game live. Um, you, and also with Darren Sproles, he's, uh, I mentioned this in my article as well, I went out this morning, he is by far their most dangerous weapon for the Eagles. He, there's, you can't match up with Darren Sproles. There's, you, you, it's impossible to me. When he was with the Saints, that was Sproles. one of my most you know, favorite offenses to watch the Drew Brees dumping the ball off to seemingly all the playmakers they had and Damon Sproles running up and down the sideline on seemingly every single defense. He, you know, you're right about that. He is ex- one of the more explosive players in the league. And if you if you get him on a team that knows how to use him, like Chip Kelly knows how to do 
there's no better spot for him to be. I, I definitely agree. Um, it's actually a good thing because um, uh, DeMarco Murray and uh, Ryan Matthews, the Cowboys defense is suited to stop runners like that. This team flows to the ball. They swarm. If the first guy doesn't get you, there's literally someone right behind him to get you on the ground. And, and the Eagles offense, they run east to west a lot when they're running the ball. It's east to west a lot. That's not DeMarco Murray's or Ryan Matthews' strength, but that's where the money is. I, uh, if I were Chip Kelly and the Eagles, there's no way Darren Sproles wouldn't have at least 10 runs a game, uh, at least another seven catches, because he it's just impossible to match up with him. It's a completely different game. You To stop Darren Sproles, the Cowboys are going to have to completely swarm around him whenever the ball is in his – in his hands, uh, when he goes out for pass routes, if he goes on a wheel route, where well, they'll probably run several times. Uh, pff, I'm not even. I, I, I can't even guess how, who would be out there who can match up and cover that. You have to have perfect anticipation, watch your watch the film, and know exactly when that ball is probably going to be released and out because Darren Sproles is going to run past you um, if you just try to rely on physical right. ability because he's so fast. Um, he's the biggest. If a uh, Cowboys Cowboys fans are listening, that's the player that when he's in the game, just hope that the team tackles him and on the first try because if not, he's going to pick up 20, 25 yards easily. And let's talk a little bit, little bit more about the Eagles side of things with those running backs. Obviously, DeMarco Murray is the storyline with the Cowboys facing the former Cowboy now in Philadelphia. And you know, Let's talk about what we saw from Murray Bradford and the entire Eagles team in the week one loss to the Falcons. And it really was... Stunning for some people, but probably not as stunning for people who are familiar with Chip Kelly. You know, me as an Oregon fan, I have seen all those plays before. It, but it was really stunning to see, you know, the way they used Murray and Bradford. They were, I know ESPN was hyping up in the pregame the fact that they were college roommates and how it's so great for them to hopefully have some success for a sustained period of time together. But, you know, th- this offense is just dizzying to watch for a guy like Murray who's probably still a bit worn down from last year. It's, they, it was literally just give him the ball for a couple yards, they're right back to the line, they cut to a close-up of Murray, checking out the defensive line, him and Bradford both trying to read the defensive line, make a read on the defensive end, figure out what they're doing next snap, and yes, it got going for him in the second half when he picked up those two short touchdowns, but for the most part, you know, not what we're used to seeing from DeMarco Murray, and really just a bizarre game on both sides for the Eagles, and it didn't work out. They found some momentum. They, they finally got that offense going, but they fell to 0-1. Um, I agree with you completely. I believe um, DallasCowboys.com um, staff writer scout uh, Brian Broaddus, when the deal was made for DeMarco going to the Eagles, he immediately pointed out this is not the greatest match for DeMarco Murray. They just happened to give him a lot of money. It's uh, Especially because I watched Chip Kelly when he was at Oregon, those offenses, it's, it doesn't suit his style. The um, the the play that Murray scored on was a toss to the outside where he immediately got a field. It wasn't this side to side run which he they ran a few times with him and it's like that's just not that's not his game. So I I I, I kind of question and I know there's been a lot of talk um, by Eagles um, sports um, sport radio sports and their writers about what are you doing and a lot of the fans are mad like you get you spend all this money on Demarco why what is why is he only touched the ball like all up, only a few times. It it does to me. It's just it's never going to be a great fit. He's not going to match his contract there because of how they of how they run their offense. But I definitely suspect they're not going to throw the ball 52 times unless the Cowboys are beating them by 21 or more. So I definitely expect them to come out this game and try to run. How they run is a different story. If they try to go east to west again, I I don't see that working against a Marinelli defense because they that you will see you will see Nick Hayden scraping down. Uh, the one technique, defensive tackle, over 300 pounds, he's going to be chasing the play. Everyone's going to be chasing the play. That's not You don't want DeMarco Murray running east-west, and you don't want Ryan Matthews running east-west. If you're going to do that, you should go with Sproles. But they're probably not going to do that. And for that, as scouting the, scouting the team, I'm actually very thankful because the fewer touches Sproles has, the happier I am as a Cowboys fan and you know, staff, as a staff, staff writer, because I don't want to write the story that, oh, yeah, Darren Sproles scored three touchdowns, 220 total yards on the game. Yeah, that that's not something I really want to write. So in that aspect, they can have at it that way. Yeah, that won't be fun. So before we go elsewhere around the NFC East, I got some Giants fans that want to 
chime in in here in studio. But first, let's stick with this game and get a score prediction from you. Cowboys at the Eagles, week two. What are you going for the score? I really never uh, pick scores. <laughs> um, it's so I expect this game to be extremely close. Uh, I think it really it's going to come down to Sam Sam Bradford. I, I believe he'll make the mistake or several mistakes. If the when, when pressure's in his face, that'll give the Cowboys an opportunity for an interception. When that happens, that play has to be made. Uh, Brandon Carr had one last week. He did not make that play, but if it happens this week. It's going to need to be that play. Interception is going to need to be made. So I think the Cowboys are going to win a close game. Uh, I, I do think their their offense can present some problems for the Eagles' defense because uh, there is matchups in their favors, as you mentioned earlier. Cole Beasley, Gavin Askabar is probably going to see the field a lot more. Jason Witten is still Jason Witten, even though people don't talk about him as much. He's still Jason Witten, and Mr. he's still going to see some targets. Uh, Terrence Wil- uh, Terrence Williams is going to have his chance to step up and make some plays as well. So. Uh, if I had to go, if I had to pick a score, uh, 28, 24, maybe. That seems about right. You know, both teams approaching the 30s. I, I have a feeling one of the teams might get to the 30s, but I could see just outside of that. 28, 24 seems like a good spot to go. I'll go 31, 28, a little bit higher in favor of the Cowboys still. So now, while we have you on the line here, We'll go around the rest of the NFC East matchups, and let's go to MetLife Stadium for the Falcons, hmm. who we ta- just talked about a little bit in their week one win against the Eagles. Playing a Giants team that obviously we just saw a lot of when we just discussed a lot of with what they were able to do, blowing that game against the Cowboys with Fasad Jennings and Eli Manning. And I think they have another bad matchup this week against an Atlanta team who has Matt Ryan, where if you give him time to throw, he's going to have a his guys to throw to and Julio Jones. Falcons defense is much improved with Dan Quinn. And we know that the Giants don't have much of a pass rush with what we've seen from Jason Pierre Paul's hands. So what are your thoughts on this matchup so far? Uh, that um Julio Jones I know has he missed the uh, first two days of practice this week with a hamstring issue. Uh if I was a Giants fan I would hope that flares up when for pre game warmers and he doesn't play because he is the one deep threat the uh, Falcons can go to, and if he were to be inactive, they would actually um, probably have um, Justin Hardy active for that game, who's a rookie out of East Carolina, um, my actually alumni. Um, he's not a deep threat, but he's a, he's a great route runner underneath. So that they, if Julio Jones is active, there's a huge problem because I, without bringing the house against um, against the Falcons, I don't see how they get to Matt Ryan with their with their front four. It's just, they just they did nothing against the Cowboys. Well, again, I'll say this again: Falcons' offensive line is not at the caliber of the Dallas Cow- offensive line, so there might be, so there might be some difference there that the Giants can take advantage of. But if they don't get any pass rush, this game is going to be a problem because Tevin Tevin Coleman had a good game um, as well last impressive. week in the running game. So it's, and I just hope for the, the sake of the Giants and their team that there's all the talk in the media after the game, what Coughlin did, what McAdoo did, what Eli did, and all that stuff is out of the locker room by now. I'm sure Rashad Jennings or um, yeah, Rashad Jennings and Eli probably had a little bit of a talk about what Rashad said to the media because that was a little dumb. Uh, I'll just go on and say you, you don't say that. You just be quiet about what you were told to do in that situation. Don't, don't say that. that that's horrible. Uh, for the team, because you know you're going to hear about that all week, and especially a market like New York. So I, it really depends. I don't think the Falcons are a perfect team by any stretch of the imagination. They have problems on on um, on defense as well, but I don't think Cruz is playing either. It sounds like he's been sitting out all week as well, so that means Odell is going to see the same exact coverage as he saw against Dallas, and he wasn't that successful against it. So that's going to be a t- tough game both ways. Hey, Walter, it's John Galletly, the Giants representative here in the studio, or one of them anyway. Turn his mic off. <laughs> <laughs> and going into this game, I, as a Giants fan, I, I'm actually pretty optimistic that we can actually pull it off. I think you're right that the Falcons and the Giants are pretty similar teams where I think they're known for their quarterbacks and wide receivers rather than their defenses of late. So do you think the Giants, should fans should be optimistic with the history of them playing at MetLife Stadium, where the Giants have had success over them? Uh, uh, 
if the Giants' defensive line plays better this week, there's definitely a chance. Um, I mean, even even though the Falcons have a new staff and everything, they're not known for their running game. Um, so if that holds up, is yet to be seen. If they stop the run game, that puts a lot of pressure on Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan can make mistakes, and if Julio Jones doesn't play, even even a hobbled Julio Jones helps the Giants um, Giants secondary. So there is. I, I don't think this is a no-brainer win for the Falcons at all. Either team can definitely win this game. I think it's going to be a really close game. The Giants are just going to. In certain ways, I'll say this, I think the Giants coaching staff might have cost them the game against Dallas because the, the decisions in the past last five minutes were, were, were ridiculous. Watching the game, I was like, what are they doing? Like, why? Like, what are you doing? Like, even Eli throwing the ball away is like, you just gave Tony Romo all this time. I think Did everybody was stunned when that ball went through the back of the end zone. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was kind of was like, you're serious? Okay, thank you. Um, Jason, so, thank I mean, you very I think much. the Giants can definitely win this game, yeah. Yeah, and it seems in the in the New York market, the Giants have gotten a lot of smack for that play that we basically handed you the game right there. Me and Sean were watching the Giants-Cowboys game together, and do you think that if the Giants win on Sunday, this all goes away and that people, don't, people are going to stop talking about this big mistake that Eli and the coaching staff made? With the way the NFL goes, all the talk will be on beating – only they just beat the Falcons if – if the Falcons beat the Giants, and especially if it's a close game where you can start to cherry pick every single decision that Eli and Coughlin made, oh, it's going to just intensify. It's going to be pretty bad. If 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 that's the case, I could see again every time this happens, the Giants market starts calling for Coughlin's job, and that's usually actually I remember the last time it happened the Giants won the Super Bowl that year so maybe that would be good for the Giants fans. <laughs> yeah, it seems like that, that sparks that up um, every now and then and then dies yeah. down yeah they Giants fans notoriously have always wanted him fired every time the team has a little slow start like you look at his record and look at the track record of teams they usually do start slow then they usually pick it up so I've never quite understood outside looking at why Giants fans are always calling for Tom Coughlin to be fired with his track record yeah uh, go ahead, John. Uh, <laughs> hey, Walter, how are you doing? It's Joey Valdez, the other Giants representative here in studio. Um, I think Poor me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, me as a Giants fan, honestly, naturally, I tend to be a bit realistic with the team, and I think that right now, realistically, I wouldn't be surprised if you know if they lost this game against Atlanta because mostly because and I and I know. Uh, I always say this, and I've been saying this for the past, what, two two years now, uh, that, you know, that offensive line has been just not what it used to be, say, 2011 and even before that. Um, and I think the pass protection with Eli is pretty bad. Um, not, I don't, I don't, not, not pretty bad, but, you know, it's not good. It's not what it used to be back then, say, maybe uh, five years ago. Um, and also... Eli, he's lacking a lot of weapons. I mean, like you just mentioned, Victor Cruz, he's, he's, I think he's going to be out for the game with the, with the calf. And, you know, all that is left is really uh, uh, Odell Beckham Jr. And, again, the running game is not really there yet. They're still trying to find, you know, what the heck is going on with, you know, with Jennings. And, uh, again, and also the defense is just, you know, there's so many holes in the defense. I mean, after Justin Tuck left, and I mean, I mean that was pretty much it. That was the last, really, the last um, – the last really important piece of that defense. I mean, Jason Pierre-Paul, and after that fireworks incident, it's like, really? Great. That's wonderful. Now, you know, you, you're missing you're missing like three fingers, you know, and you really, you know, <coughs> playing defense like that is really going to be a bit hard, you know. So I think all in all, I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if my Giants lose this game. However, history has shown that we've started 0-2 before and we won the Super Bowl that year. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, I'm just throwing that out there. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if New York loses to uh, to Atlanta. Is John Beeson playing? I think he's doubtful. So no. <laughs> that was that was big last week. Uh, I don't remember his name, but the rookie middle linebacker that they filled that filled in for him, did he, he left some plays on the field? John the, Beeson is the win. No good. Uh, John Beeson, I feel like, is someone kind of like Luke Keekley on the Panthers where he can make a big impact for the Giants' defense, especially with their secondary not being the best this year. He's a year. bit like the Sean Way. Would you say that's fair, Walter? Mm. Not to the I don't uh, think Beeson is as bad. 
Uh, a beast, uh, I wouldn't compare him. To, I don't think he has the athletic skills as a Sean Lee. Yeah, but he's it, not as fast. There was definitely a there was definitely a big hole in the Giants' defense when John Beeson was not playing. You could that was there were so many plays that the touchdown to Witten in the game that was all on the middle linebacker. I don't know what he was doing, but that made it easy. Right, and so one more matchup to get in the NFC is too. We got the Cowboys and the Eagles is probably the best matchup from the division so far this week. Giants and the Falcons going to be very interesting, and now you have. Unfortunately, we have to talk about them. The Washington Redskins <laughs> hosting the St. Louis Rams. Where you I mean, know the I Redskins, guess they're relevant. Yeah, I guess for now, maybe one more week. But I think they're already irrelevant. You, you look at the Redskins; they put up a pretty good fight, and I know scared you in your survivor pool, John. They put up a pretty good fight against the Miami Dolphins. It was a they had know, me sweating bullets. They seem to always <laughs> find a way to lose, and this week it was or last week I should say it was Jarvis Landry who ran a punt back for the Dolphins. That was the winning score. Kurt Cousins did throw a pick six, so you want to see him improve there. But the Redskins showed great fight. I don't think it's going to last this week. I think they're going to get beaten to the ground by this Rams defensive front, Robert Quinn, Aaron Donald. If they can get after Russell Wilson, they can get after an un, you know, immovable, not agile Kurt Cousins, and I think the Redskins are going to fall to 0-2 pretty emphatically against the uh, against the Rams. What do you think, Walter? Uh, their offensive line is well. The, speaking of the Redskins, their offensive line is really bad. It is and the broken. Rams defensive line is really good, like really good. <laughs> uh, that's about as much as you really need to say there, because there there is an, a bigger embarrassment. Well, if you want to remove whatever the, the whatever it is the Patriots are doing, you, there's no <laughs> biggest embarrassment to the NFL right now than the Redskins how they're running their team, because. Um, Everything with RG3 oh, to Jay Gruden, I don't know. what He will never be a head coach again in the NFL no. uh, after he's fired. He will be fired. <laughs> it's, uh, Kirk Cousins is going to turn the ball over. He's going to see Aaron Donald and all of those other defensive linemen in his face all game. They, they have no, this game should not be close. I don't think the Rams are going to win their division. I still think. The, Se- the Seahawks, if they can figure out something on there with their offensive line, are still the better team, best team in that division. But the Rams should really yeah. just completely beat yeah. beat the wheels off the Redskins. And I, that's coming from – I haven't watched any tape of either one of those teams, but just looking at it on paper, those two, that that's a mismatch. Like, it, it couldn't be a bigger mismatch with Redskins offense yeah. against the Rams defense. It's, it's bad. It's bad, yeah. I thought Absolutely. of – in my survivor pool, I actually thought about picking against the Redskins again for the second week in a row. But I think the one thing that held me back from doing that is that I don't know the true identity of this Rams team. I feel like, yes, they're coming off of a big, big win against the Seahawks opening week. But I think the one thing that concerns me about the Rams this week is that they might fe- their heads might get inflated thinking they beat the defending NFC champions. And this, could en- this may have a small chance of ending up being a trap game at Washington. That is true. Um, I just don't see. I just don't see the talent on that offense at all, and their defense. I mean, Ryan. The Redskins are going to have to find a way to sustain drives, which I don't think they can do. No, Kirk Cousins is not the person you want leading that team. He's turnover prone. Honestly, if you're not going to start RG three, I would start Colt McCoy because I I feel safer with Colt McCoy because he's not going to probably turn the ball over as much. Mm-hmm. Kirk Cousins will fumble it. He's going to throw it to the other team. I, I don't like Kirk Cousins, especially for the situation the Redskins are in. It's it's just a mess there. It's possible that the Rams are not going to be what they showed against the uh, Seahawks. That's definitely possible. They played a a good game there. Uh, it, I can't. They would have to play pretty. Nick Foles would have to be pretty bad. Uh, I think Ty Gurley might actually be making his debut this game. Billy uh, Cunningham, uh, Benny Cunningham, Billy Cunningham, uh, their running back. Um, we had a good game last week, so I, I don't see how the Redskins stop the Rams enough times to make their offense, to give their offense a shot. Their offense is just that can't see it from them. Absolutely. They should win probably four games this year. <laughs> yeah, that seems about right, if not a little bit high. Yeah. I think that's generous. Yeah, yeah that could be. A <laughs> Took bit the generous. words right out of my mouth. You, uh, Walter and John, I mean, the Redskins are just absolutely pitiful, horrible team. 
Horrible that starts with their head coach. Jay yeah. Gruden should not have it. He should be fired already. If you want my <laughs> Dan Snyder should be fired. That organization fired. is yeah. so bad. That, <laughs> that whole I think they just need a new owner. They need a new GM. They need like they, they need, need a, a whole team name apparently according to some yeah people. apparently to some people they just they just need a whole little, you know revamp of everything. I will everything. I will say this about their name. The watch the, 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 the there is there is a lot of articles about that when it first broke and actually the concept art for. Uh, the Washington Warriors, that logo actually looked really good. They should probably run with that one. Actually, that actually one looked pretty cool. And that doesn't cool sound too Washington bad either. Warriors. I mean, Washington Warriors, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Sounds a little bit that cheesy, but, you know. I like, like. I like it. All right, hey. Walter, thanks so much for joining us on a Pond Photo Review. You'll definitely have you on again sometime soon, hopefully breaking down a Cowboys win in Philadelphia. But we will see what shapes up around the NFL and around the NFC East. For now, we're going to take a quick break. Number to call, 973-655-4256. Walter, thanks again for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. So once again, that was Walter Yeats, staff writer at InsideTheStore.com, where you can check out a lot of the great work he's been doing so far. So moving right along here on the show, 534, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 